the Fed has cut interest rates and it was by 50 basis points. Now this was higher than the 25 BPS that investors were expecting and we also note this was the first interest rate cut that we have seen since the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Now our focus is going to be on realty income which is down more than 2% today and bear in mind this does offer a yield which is paid out on a monthly basis of over 5%. Now we also note that there is around 2.6 trillion worth of dollars that are sitting currently on the sidelines by retail investors and what's very interesting to note is with the interest rate cuts that we have seen today, savings accounts for many consumers will be lowered and they may be looking now to put their money into companies like Realty Income where they can get some very strong yields that will be sitting higher than their savings accounts after the cuts that we have seen yesterday. Now what is also interesting to note for those that are new, historical data also shows us not just over the next quarter, not just over the next two quarters, but in fact over the next four quarters, REITs, that is real estate investment trusts, tend to outperform the equity markets. So a positive sign that in fact maybe investing in REITs could be a good way forward, especially if you do have money on the sidelines. We also note a triple buy rating that is from Seeking Alpha, Wall Street and Quam. And we can also see over the last 52 weeks, it has sat at $63.39 as its 52 week high. As we already mentioned, paid out monthly dividends 5.08% and a P to FFO of around 14.82. We also see over the last 12 months, it is up 13%. Over the last 10 years, it is up only 47%. Bear in mind, this doesn't include dividends reinvested, and we will show you its performance against the S&P. We also note just before that COVID drop in February 2020, it was sitting at $82. It hasn't recovered since then, but it will be interesting to see whether or not now, with the aggressive cuts that the market is expecting, whether this company now trading around $60 will go above the $80 mark we have seen not too long ago. Now we're also going to cover the dividend safety and some of their metrics. But before we do that, we just want to highlight some very bullish things for this company moving forwards. First thing to note about this company, it does hold around $26 billion worth of debt. And we in fact note around 25 billion of that is fixed, which does equate to around 94%. Now, whilst the interest rate is very low on that, on average around 3.9%, before we were getting interest rate cuts when this company was trading in the 40s and the 50s, there was a lot of talk about how this company would fail due to the fact that they will have to refinance a lot of their debt at the very high rate. What we can in fact see here is not only is it around 3.9%, which is already lower than the interest rate right now, but on average, it has around 5.6 years until they will need to refinance. And given the interest rate cuts that are coming and are expected, this will likely be even lower than what they have historically. So this is a good sign for realty income moving forwards, something that was spun by investors as a big fat negative. Now, we also want to highlight a lot of good things that this company is doing. It isn't just staying still. In fact, not too long ago, they did partner with a blue chip operator. And what makes this very interesting is that it is a European retailer and in fact, one of the largest as we can see here. We do in fact note that Decathlon are the third largest sporting goods retailer and it isn't the only place where this company has moved to in terms of European access. We can in fact see some of their European clients do include very large companies. You will know these if you are European yourself. We have B&Q, Asda, Sainsbury's, Tesco, Decathlon, as we just mentioned, as well as Careful. And we can see that split based on annualized contractual rent. Now, for those that want to see the portfolio for the US a little bit closer to home, we can, in fact, see their top 20 clients are made up of some very big names. And on historical episodes, we have covered some potential issues that we do see with some of their largest clients as they have been looking to close some of their stores. But as we can see here, Dollar General, their largest in terms of annualized rent, 3.4%, Walgreens at 3.3%, and their third coming in at Dollar Tree and Family Dollar at 3.1%. What is also nice to note is the fact in terms of diversification across the industries, it isn't all just in one. And we also note the companies do themselves sit within different areas. We have service oriented, non-discretionary, low price point, as well as non-retail, really showing the diversification with realty income. Now, getting back to the actual metrics, we have a safety score of 80. 
as we said a yield although it does fluctuate now around 5.22 we get an undervaluation signal that we will cover shortly as well as their latest increase around 3% but as we have seen this is a company that does tend to increase their dividend more than once a year and on this channel we do ideally want to see at least around the 4% level just to keep up in line with inflation. Now they did reaffirm their dividend in August so just a few weeks ago that it is safe and ultimately what this means a dividend cut does look to be unlikely. Now we always on this channel like to look at some key metrics now these are from the great recession 0709 realty income in fact increased the dividend they had above average growth 0.8 percent negative which was above the smp's negative 12 and they also marginally outperformed the smp itself in terms of return negative 43 smp negative 55. as we mentioned three percent increase over the last full year three percent over the last five years and over the last 20 years if you have been a long-term holder on top of a very nice starting yield you are getting a marginal increase on top of the inflationary four percent we also note they are a dividend aristocrat they have increased those dividends 25 years or more and in fact been paying a dividend without a reduction for the last 55 years as we mentioned based on this model it does have an undervaluation signal and over the last 20 years we can see there are periods where this company has been trading above its fair value as well as the period now which we can see in better detail over the last year where we see it trading right at the lower end of what they do deem to be the fair value now we will cover the valuation in a lot more detail towards the end of the episode what we also like to do on this channel dividend yield theory states a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average so we have an undervaluation signal here as well as on the forward p to affo 14.2 lower than the five-year rolling of 17.2 and we also note, in fact, in today's episode of Realty Income, a triple undervaluation signal as the real estate sector P to AFFO, this relates to the adjusted funds from operation, does sit higher. So already off to a good start in terms of seeking undervaluation. And whilst we do on this channel like to draw your attention to the free cash flow, due to the volatility of REITs, we have to focus on the adjusted FFO, where we want below 90%. And that is what we see, in fact, in a declining nature, 76% in 23, 74 anticipated over the next 12 months. So no worries whatsoever. And we can start to understand why this company has a safe dividend. Similar to free cash flow per share, we want AFFO increasing over the longer term and consistent, which is exactly what we see from realty income. In fact, a nice increase to 427 is expected over the next 12 months. Then we look at the growth for those that want to see it in terms of a percentage format and whilst it does fluctuate we ideally want to see around three to seven percent which is what we get near enough every year four percent anticipated over the next 12 months and for their top line growth five to ten percent which we can clearly see they do hit if not significantly better as indicated just over the last three years now those who want to see it on the numerical format we can also show they have more than quadrupled their top line from 2014 to 2023 now shares outstanding if you're a regular viewer you know that for REITs they will dilute your position over the longer term something we can clearly see realty income has done so something to bear in mind a lot of REITs will dilute your position but at varying rates realty income unfortunately is one that dilutes it at a very rapid rate that is why it is important to ensure that all other metrics are growing accordingly then we get to the roic three to five percent for REITs giving us faith management are able to effectively allocate their capital we can see 3% over the last two years would be nice to get back to the consistency of the 4% from 2014 to 2020. Then we get to the operating margin side where we see some good numbers and consistency around the 40 to 50% point. And then finally, the net debt to EBITDA, very important for REIT due to the fact it does correlate to both dividend safety and balance sheet strength. Now, ideally, we want below 5.5 where we can see it has straddled along that year on year. Remember, below the numbers indicate to us the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. 6.05 in the more recent year, a little bit tricky. We do want to see 5.5. Takeaway here, though, is that over the next 12 months, it is anticipated to come down to 5.18. So definitely we should keep an eye on, ensure that they can hit that. And when we do consider this, alongside the decreasing nature of the AFFO payout, their dividend does look to be safe which is very important, especially for a monthly dividend paying company. Now, we also want to let you know we have released our latest free weekly article. We deliver these every single Monday completely free, where we also look at the market and undervalued stocks that have caught our attention for that week and that month. You can also sign up and grab access to 25 undervalued dividend stocks 
for your consideration for the month of September and we also run through which one sits within our own portfolio and on top of that this month we have also released 22 undervalued dividend stocks that have the most upside according to Wall Street so go ahead sign up below and you can start reading straight away. Now within our analysis we also like to incorporate what are the institutions and insiders doing starting off with institutional ownership 71% 1.5 billion worth of sales by these institutions over the last year. We see a lot more buying by the institutions over the same time period. However, we do note in the more recent quarter, so that is Q2, there has been a little bit more selling than buying. Although if you do go back quarter on quarter, we do notice the general theme of institutions as a whole is to buy a lot more than they do sell. When we replicate this for insiders, what we note here, very low 0.1% ownership, and we do see just selling, no buying, around $882,000 worth, with around $411,000 being in the more recent quarter of Q3 2024. And what we can in fact see when we look into the detail for the transparency, that Mary, the director, did sell just around last week, the 11th of November, for around $107,000 worth of shares. Now remember that we never really take this as a bearish signal. Insiders sell for many reasons, personal or financial, and regardless of insiders, institutions, other investors, always do your own due diligence and never copy what they do. What we also want to draw your attention to here is not just the top line, but also the bottom line net income. We've already shown over the last 10 years, their top line has more than effectively quadrupled, going from 934 million to 4.1 billion in 2023. So what we want to highlight is what kind of story can we see from their bottom line net income? And whilst we do see some inconsistency purely from a graphical basis, we do note it has pretty much tripled from 271 million in 2014 to 872 but again over the last year it has looked fairly flat so always don't just look at the top line it is good to analyze the bottom line net income of companies as well to understand the total picture of a company's financial performance that is why though we also incorporate the balance sheet review a quick cash versus total debt health check and what we can see they had around 4 million of cash in 2014 443 million in their latest quarterly report so over the longer term we can see it has increased although very inconsistent on a year-on-year -year basis now remember that number in isolation doesn't tell us anything which is why we always compare it both numerically and directionally to their total debt which has increased from around 5 billion in 2014 to around 26 billion in the latest report that is pretty much a five times increase and we can clearly see year on year it has been increasing. Now bear in mind for REITs, this is very typical. We will see this for them to grow. But as always, when we look at the net debt to EBITDA metric that was sitting around six, it is something that as always we need to closely monitor, not just with this REIT realty income, but also others you may have either in your portfolio or on your watch list. Now, how have they performed in terms of against analyst targets? Well, out of the last four quarters, they actually missed two of them. So that is a 50% track record. In terms of the more recent quarter, Q2, they did have a marginal beat. And in terms of moving forwards, next four quarters, anticipating growth year on year to the funds from operation. Ultimately, with the FFO estimate increasing into 2025, it will lower the P to FFO to around 14.1. Before we get to the actual valuation, we can look at some of the underlying metrics. Now they get a B minus, and ultimately what we really want to see here for REITs is the price to AFFO on a forward-looking basis, similar to how we look to a P on a forward-looking basis for other companies. And you can clearly see here the calculation for this metric. Now at 14.84, we already discussed earlier, it does sit below the sector as a whole, Ultimately, what this means, you are paying around a 13% discount for realty income against the real estate industry as a whole. Whether or not it is warranted and at what type of discount we are satisfied to buy this company are the type of questions we need to be thinking about. Then we look at their growth and they do get an A+, as we can clearly see. A lot of different metrics that we have run through when we looked at the metrics earlier. We then move to the growth grade where they get an A+. A lot of the metrics we have already covered when we did the analysis not too long ago, but you can see these on screen. Then we move to the final one where they get the profitability of an A. Again, a lot of very similar metrics that we have covered. But for example, they get an A plus on cash from operations, which is significantly high at 3.3 billion, down the sector of around 233. Now, what we would say in terms of a conclusion, we still get that triple buy rating from all three analysts, something we have seen over the last few months. We get a B minus on valuation, an A plus on growth with an A on profitability. And again, we can in fact see these metrics are unchanged 
from over the last three and the last six months. We also want to see how have they performed against others in the sector? Are there any issues isolated to this company or the industry as a whole? We have retail REITs, so SPG, Kimco Realty, as well as some very big names. In terms of the performance over the last year, do bear in mind total return, so including reinvesting those dividends. Realty income, not the worst. 20% is still fairly decent for a performance over a 12-month period. That is, however, the lowest performing. So whilst you could argue reasonable in terms of the overall performance, in terms of the sector as a whole, it is one of the lowest players. Then when we take a look over the last five years, we actually see them again right there towards the bottom. In fact, a very mediocre 5%. So over the last five years, they have struggled quite significantly, as we can clearly see. Do bear in mind, COVID would have been captured within that period. Over the last 10 years, interesting, they go from the bottom performer right to the top, 138%. So as always, do bear in mind, what is your investment strategy? What is your time horizon? If you're looking for just a very short term, maybe this type of company isn't one for your portfolio. If you are looking for the longer term, if you're an income investor, then maybe this could be up for serious consideration. We also want to point out the final analysis before our valuation. How does it form against the SMP on a total return basis? Well, over the last 12 months, not too far off, 23% realty income, S&P around 26%. Over the last five years, a massive underperformance as we can see. S&P has recovered very strongly since the COVID drop, realty income less so. And when we zoom out over the last 10 years, whilst not too far off, there is still a bit of difference. S&P has outperformed 185 versus the 145 from O. Now, ultimately, whether or not you believe that this company will outform in the longer term against the S&P, it does depend what type of investor you are. Income investors, they may not mind as much if they are using the money. To those that are seeking long-term return, then maybe it is a question of whether or not you see realty income outperforming over the next 10, 20, whatever your long-term horizon is. Now let's jump into the valuation model. As always, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continue notified of these videos as they drop. Now our intrinsic value of $68, how we got to this? Well, the first model that we used was the multiples valuation. We have companies in this similar sector and size that we analyze. Their P to AFFO multiple, the average of that as well as that of realty income, giving us our intrinsic value of $76. So we have our first undervaluation signal. Just bear in mind, we don't look at any one of these models in isolation. We then have the dividend discount model with the growth over the last few years. As we can see, around 3.14. We've gone from around that at 3.25, and we get our second undervaluation signal with an intrinsic value of $67. We then have the DCF model with the free cash flow year on year, moving forwards at 8% in line with management targets. And the discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flow and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by shares outstanding, and again, a marginal undervaluation score, giving us three for three and an intrinsic value, just the average of those we have gone through today. As a reminder, you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below, running through your own numbers, whether it's for realty income or any others that you do desire. We also like to do a margin of safety on this channel where we execute on 10% if we believe it meets our three golden criteria. That is a wide moat, strong financial metrics and good forward looking data. Now, if you believe that in today's episode, it is a buy up around $61, which you could argue isn't too far off the current trading price. Now, for those looking at 15%, it isn't quite there yet at $58, at 20% around 55. And maybe this is one that you do believe will come down. But as we mentioned, a lot of money right now sitting on the sidelines, sitting in savings account. And as the interest rate cuts, we will see money moved into the market and ultimately into some high yielding companies, for example, realty income, as well as many others. So right now you are getting a 10 cent MOS, maybe enough for income investors, maybe not for those that are seeking a bit more value. And we can in fact see Wall Street giving this $67 price target, upside of 11%, and as we saw at the beginning of the episode, a triple buy rating, seeking alpha, Wall Street, and quant. As always, do give us your thoughts in the comments below. Is this one you're buying? Is this one maybe you're just holding for now? Or for whatever reason, maybe you're looking to sell. Don't forget to sign up to the free weekly newsletter below. Come and join us in the Patreon where we do talk about our weekly buys and sells. And as always, have a great day, and we'll see you all on the next one.